Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Caitlin Saladino. I'm the Director of Strategic Development here at Brookings Mountain West. And on behalf of my colleagues, Bill Brown, Ashley LeClaire, our Executive Director, Dave Damore, our entire staff of student researchers, and our colleagues from the Lindsay Institute who are here tonight, I want to thank you for coming out to our second talk in the Brookings Scholar Lecture Series this fall. I also want to take a brief moment, if possible, to acknowledge uh, Tom Kaplan, who's here with us tonight as well, from Wolfgang Puck Fine Dining Group. Uh, in addition to Tom's extensive work in the community, uh, he's also a donor for Brookings Mountain West, a trustee at the Brookings Institution, and of course, a big supporter of the things we do here, like this event tonight would not be possible without his support. So thanks for being here, Tom. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank the team at UNLV TV here at Greenspun College who are helping us out with recording the lecture you'll see tonight. We've recorded well over 100 of these in total, and you can see all of those on our website or on our YouTube page, Brookings Mountain West. Um, take a look at them. There are lots of different topics. Um, tonight, no different. We'll record this. It'll be available on our website in a few days so you can review it if there's anything you want to catch again. This week, we've had the pleasure of welcoming back Samantha Gross to the UNLV campus. This is her third visit to Brookings Mountain West, but it's been a little bit since she's been here. Uh, the last time she was here, her lecture as part of this series was focused on new geopolitics as we had just left the Paris Climate Agreement. So that'll give you a sense of how long it's been. Um, a few things obviously have changed in our world since then and certainly in, in Samantha's research as well. So we're really excited to learn more from her tonight. Um, she's joining us this week from the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., where she's a fellow in the Foreign Policy Program and the director of the Energy Security and Climate Initiative. Like all our Brookings scholars, she's been very busy this week, very busy, um, <laughs> engaging with all of our students here at UNLV, speaking to classes, uh, speaking to our administration here, stakeholders in the community, workshops with students, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and so we're really, really thrilled to have her back. I'll give you a little bit about Samantha's background and then we'll kick off the talk tonight. Uh, Samantha's work explores the intersection of energy, the environment and policy. Samantha has more than 25 years experience in energy and environmental affairs. Her research examines uh, the topics of climate policy and international cooperation, the transition to net zero emissions energy systems, uh, uh, energy geopolitics, and the global energy market. Prior to joining the Brookings Institution, Samantha served as director of the Office of International Climate and Clean Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. In that role, she directed U.S. activities under the Clean Energy Ministerial, including the Secretariat and initiatives focusing on clean energy implementation and access and energy efficiency. She also worked at the Government Accountability Office on the Natural Resources and Environment Team and as an engineer directing environmental assessment and remediation projects. She holds a Bachelor of Science in chemical engineering from the University of Illinois, a master of science in environmental engineering from Stanford, and an MBA from Berkeley. If you would please help me, welcome Samantha. Thank you so much for that kind of that kind introduction. I feel like I've heard my whole resume lay out in front of me. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. It's a pleasure to see you all, some people I haven't met yet, and some people I've seen in classes this week. So I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Um, when we think about climate change, we immediately start thinking about fossil fuels, um, coal, oil, and natural gas. Burning fossil fuels is clearly the primary d driver of the climate crisis that we see today. So obviously, we need to stop doing that. Stop using fossil fuels. OK, I'm done. Let's, go, let's all go out and have dinner. <laughs> OK. But why I'm really here, there actually is a talk behind this. Um, I spoke at a conference a few years ago. And then I did a presser with a bunch of people, and I answered a lot of questions. And after the whole press corps had left, um, a single reporter came up to me. And he said, you know, I just don't understand. Why do we still use oil? Like, we know it's bad you know, climate change, pollution, why are we still doing this? And at first, I was a little surprised that I got a question that was really quite basic from you know, a reporter who was on the energy beat. And then I realized that this person had given me a gift because he really genuinely didn't understand why we still used oil. And I was like, I was like, Come with me. And we sat down, and I gave him the tiny little microscopic version of what I'm going to tell you guys tonight. And um, 
this has really grown because this interview really stuck in my head. I was like, this is something that people really don't understand. And so I have turned this into a really popular essay on the Brookings website that you guys can look for if you're interested. Um, a whole lot of public speaking on that topic. And um, it's even now become a book project that I'm working on, a much longer answer to this question. And the really sad thing is I can't remember who this reporter was. I keep waiting for this gentleman, and it was a guy, to come up to me and say, that was me. I remember. I was the one who started this. Because I'm embarrassed that I genuinely can't remember who it was. But um, the guy really gave me a gift. And I've kind of run with it. So I sat down and I explained to him that we use oil because oil is useful. Um, it has qualities that are very hard to replace and that we're still figuring out how to replace. And so his question led me to think about the, the transmission to his zero and emissions energy system in a different way. And not from the point of view that a lot of people take that fossil fuels are evil, but from the point of view that fossil fuels are useful. And we need to find other ways to do what fossil fuels do for us in order to deal with the climate change problem. It's not a big point of view change, but it's a different point of view change. And I think it helps us to really look at the problem and not just admire it, but understand it so we can fix it. And understanding how we got into the fossil fuel business, I think is helpful to understanding what they're good for and how we get out. Um, so I'm going to start my talk this evening with a brief history of energy. We're just going to cover a couple of centuries in a few minutes. Um, how do we get here? And then we'll talk about how we get out and what's easy and what's difficult about the switch. So before fossil fuels, we lived in an all solar economy. Not in the kind of solar economy we think of, but based on plants. Plants convert solar energy into sugar, into biomass via photosynthesis. Plants provide food for people and for animals. And then people back in the day, they did the work themselves. They got animals to do the work for them. They burned biomass for heat and light. And so clearly, all of that is solar powered. Wind and water power, which were also used before we got into fossil fuels, those are solar energy too. Um, the sun drives the, the, the water cycle and also the, um, the atmospheric patterns that bring us wind. Um, so if you think about it, the pre-modern, pre-fossil fuel world was totally in balance with the sun. People used solar energy more or less in real time. Um, but as there were more and more people, this reliance on biomass became problematic. We kind of think of the world before fossil fuels as being like a utopia, but it, but it really wasn't, um, at least once there were more of us. Like in England, for instance, wood became really scarce in the 1500s and the 1600s. As London grew to about a half a million people by 1700, the price of firewood rose faster than the price of any other commodity. And it was because of how far you had to go to get firewood, because the forests around London were just completely denuded. Just a silly fact, it was a huge and terrible crime to like steal someone's firewood or to like cut the hedges on their property for wood. This was a real criminal act because wood was expensive and it was scarce. Um, the transportation system based on biomass um, was problematic as well. By 1900, about 50,000 horses were working the streets of London, leaving behind about 1,000 tons per day of horse manure. We had a transportation system in London that was literally making people sick because it was a attracting flies and causing disease. And so this was not exactly like the clean utopia that we envision. Um, and fossil fuels opened entirely new doors for people. Instead of relying on the sun in real time through photosynthesis and natural processes, fossil fuels are a stored form of solar energy. Because all energy on Earth comes from the sun. Um, they were formed from ancient plants and microorganisms, um, millions of years of pressure and temperature. And fossil fuels allowed humanity's energy consumption to go up by orders of magnitude. We can do things that people back then never thought of. Um, the world today is completely unrecognizable 
from the early 19th century before we started using any kind of fossil fuels. Um, human health and welfare have improved remarkably because we used fossil fuels. Um, the human population has increased from about a billion in 1800 to about 8 billion today. And fossil fuels powered a lot of this. They powered the Industrial Revolution. They pulled millions of people out of poverty. And they really shaped the modern world. And at this point, let's see if I can get the computer going again. Oh, I need a password. Help. <laughs> but I get that. Ashley, help me. Coming. It's OK. So what I'm about to show you, and it's going to come up momentarily, <laughs> is the evolution of energy use since 1800. Um, and as we pull this up, and it's OK that this hasn't started yet, because I'm still talking. As we pull this up, I want you to look at something. You will notice that no source of energy goes away. So here we go. Starting at 1800, biomass. At this point, we start to change from wood to coal, and we keep going. But still, look at biomass. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's still there. You go through the Model T introduced. You start to see oil. Post-World War II, Broman oil. Now we're going to see a lot more oil. We get up to where we had issues with oil supply, and you see things flatten out a little bit. Another oil shock, more issues with oil. We go forward for a bit. China joins the WTO. Now we're going to see, watch what this bar does. As China joins the WTO and its economy grows tremendously. Then we start to have the supply boom here in the United States, and you see things continuing to go up. And here's the whole graph. But look at this. Even traditional biomass, all the way at the bottom, whoops, it didn't go anywhere. It's still there in roughly the same amount. If you look at coal there, um, and we'll just let it run again just so things show up. If you look at coal, we use three times as much coal as we did in 1965 when oil overtook coal as our largest energy source. And so we've done energy transitions before. You can see them on the graph as different things take different proportions. But nothing ever went away. We just added. Um, this is a really important point because it shows you how what we're trying to do today is different from the transitions that we've seen in the past. Um, just a fun fact. You can all say you learned something tonight. Um, there's only one form of energy that we have ever truly stopped using. Does anybody want to take a quick crack at what it was? Anyone? Um, whale oil for lighting. We genuinely stopped doing that. Everything else is still on the graph. Um, so we'll let, that, we'll let that show up for just a minute, and then, then I'll turn it off. Okay. Oh, technology. <laughs> so, so coal started the fossil fuel revolution. Um, it has more energy per unit of weight than wood or charcoal. And it also didn't involve chopping down trees, which, as we talked about, were becoming kind of scarce back in the day. Um, oil came next. And it had a really important property. It's a liquid. Um, you can do a lot of things with liquid, liquid fuels that are really handy. You can pump them. It allows the internal combustion engine that is still the basis of all transportation today. Um, my conversation with that reporter several years ago focused on why you use oil in transportation. And the fact that oil is a liquid, you can pump it, you can store it easily, and it's very energy dense, more so than coal or than wood and charcoal before it. Um, it carries about twice as much energy per unit of weight as coal. So as we're bringing on these new sources, we're bringing on sources of energy that have properties that are useful to us. This is the important thing to remember. Um, the next big innovation in energy is to talk about electricity. Um, it's not an energy source like oil or coal. It didn't, sh it didn't show up on the graph because you make it from other stuff. But electricity is amazing. It is incredibly flexible. You can use it for a lot of different things. And it's efficient and clean and quiet at the point that we use it. Electricity is amazing stuff. And like oil, it started out in lighting. But the invention of the electric motor opened up all kinds of uses. Everything from sort of different uses in industry, because electric motors are really efficient, to um, things like dishwashers and vacuum cleaners that make my life easier for sure, and probably yours. Um, 
So over the 20th century, our energy system has, has transformed from one where we used things directly. We burned a fuel to turn an engine or you know, to heat something, to one where we use a lot more electricity because it's clean and flexible and useful. Um, today, worldwide, about two thirds of the coal that we use and about one third of the natural gas that we use in the world goes into electricity. So all of these transitions I've described have a really important thing in common. Um, we've drifted towards fuels that are more energy dense and they're more convenient than the fuels that they replace. Like we've gone there because they have qualities we like. This is why we keep using fossil fuels because they're useful. And so when we think about how to get out of fossil fuels, we need to keep in mind the qualities about them that we need and think about in what uses do we need which qualities and how can we replace them? So a big part, we're switching gears now and talking, we talked about how we get into fossil fuels. Now let's talk about how we get out. Um, a really big part of that answer is electricity. When you think of um, the wind and solar generation that we talk about so much, that have gotten way cheaper over the past 10 or 15 years, um, they generate electricity. And they are far more efficient at providing energy that people can use than photosynthesis ever was. Um, this is great. This allows us to think about going back to real-time sun again, getting back in sync with the sun rather than using stored sun from fossil fuels. This is a really cool concept. Um, so the quick and not so dirty answer to climate change doesn't fix everything, but it's the simple formula, is to get emissions out of the electricity system. Stop using fossil fuels to generate electricity or at least eliminate their emissions. And then use electricity for everything we can. And like I said, electricity is great stuff. The future is electric. Remember that as you walk out the door. Um, we see this in transportation. We see this push towards electric vehicles. And to get the most out of your electric vehicle, you need to do both sides of my, of my formula. You need to run it on greener power in addition to it being electric. But if we do that, you're looking at a transportation system with vastly lower emissions than the ones we have now. And this works pretty well for like light vehicles. Electric cars are zippy, they're fun to drive. They're a quality product. Um, I'm waiting for the advertisement for an electric car where it's some bro with his hat on backwards sitting at a stoplight, looking at the guy next to him and going, uh-huh, and then gunning it off the line. Because you don't have to rev up an electric vehicle. All the power is available right then. In fact, that electric vehicle has software in it to limit the amount of power it can provide to the wheels from a dead stop so you don't destroy your tires. Um, they're fun to drive. They're, they're a great product. Um, in terms of another place where we see a lot of fossil fuels used, um, home heating. We see a lot of um, mostly natural gas. If you live up in the Northeast, you see oil used for home heating. We have a better way of doing that with electricity. Um, heat pumps are a fantastic product. Um, a heat pump actually works a bit like your air conditioner run backwards. Um, it's a really, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the geeky details of it, but it's a very thermodynamically efficient process. If you run a heat pump versus a gas fired um, like boiler or furnace, um, the heat pump is gonna be cheaper to run. It costs money to install it. And it's gonna take a long time for people's furnaces to wear out and for them to replace them with something better. But we have this technology. We know how to do it and we know how to give people something better. Um, so electricity is fantastic stuff. Um, I'm talking about all the things that it can do and it really is the future in many uses. But um, when I talked about the properties of fossil fuels that are useful, some of those properties electricity can't meet. And so it's worthwhile talking about not just the easy stuff, which I just described, but also the hard stuff. Um, you hear people say, oh, wind and solar will fix everything. They won't. When people say that, please don't believe them. They're really, really important, but they're not everything. Um, the places where electricity doesn't work, for instance, um, we're never going to see battery-powered 787s going from you know, here to Berlin. It's just not going to happen. And there's, the reason for that is that batteries are heavy. 
Very simple. If you look at pound for pound jet fuel versus a battery, that jet fuel of the same weight has 40 times more energy in it than the battery. Um, that is the simple reason why you will not see long haul jets running on batteries. The batteries are just too heavy and I don't think we'll ever see them. Certainly not during my lifetime, probably not during yours either. Um, batteries are heavy. We need something with the energy density that fossil fuels has to do that job. This is why this is a hard problem, not an easy one. Um, other places, another useful quality of fossil fuels, um, you can burn them. <laughs> Sounds a little silly, that's what they're for. But um, you can get really high heat out of burning something. Um, and there are applications where you need really high heat. Um, for instance, making cement or glass, you need very high, like 1,000 degrees C and higher temperatures. It's really hard to get that with electricity. Or if you do it, you need a lot of electricity. It's much, much easier to burn something for that application. And so that's another area where the, the qualities of fossil fuel are useful. And we need to think about that to figure out how to replace them. Um, you hear a lot about hydrogen these days. Um, in Europe especially, I get asked, is hydrogen the future? Calm down. <laughs> hydrogen is useful stuff. Hydrogen is more like electricity than it's like a fossil fuel, because you make it from something else. But it has the properties, many of the properties of a fossil fuel that are useful. You can burn it, and it doesn't produce um, carbon dioxide. Um, you can pump it, it's a gas, you can move it around, you can store it. That's not so true of electricity, particularly on the storage side. And so hydrogen is interesting stuff. But because you have to make it from something else, when people ask me, is this the fuel of the future? I'm like, it's not even a fuel, it's a starting point. But it can make a ton of sense when electricity doesn't work. You often make hydrogen from electricity. You use electricity to split water atoms into oxygen and hydrogen. Um, so if you can use that hydrogen indirectly, directly, why on earth would you use hydrogen? <laughs> because you're making the hydrogen from electricity. You know, just from a, an efficiency perspective, you want to do as few transformations as you can. But when you need something that walks and talks and quacks like a fossil fuel, um, hydrogen can work. When you need the qualities of a fossil fuel, it kind of looks like that. Carbon capture and storage is another technology that can be useful when we just can't figure out how to do it any other way. Um, and I will admit, the engineer in me, um, when I first sort of got into this, I was like, oh wow, the thermodynamics on that are terrible. Why would anyone do that? And then as I got deeper into it, there are places where it's really hard to clean it up any other way. Um, so it's not necessarily a technology meant to extend our use of fossil fuels. Um, you heard it here, um, putting a carbon capture and storage facility on a coal plant is dumb. We have better ways of doing that process. However, putting carbon capture on a cement plant may be the best way to fix the problem. Um, and I'll tell you why. So, tiny, tiny bit of technology, hang with me. Um, when you make cement, you take limestone, which is calcium carbonate, and you heat it at very high temperature, burn something, um, and you convert it into calcium oxide, which is, you grind it up and that's what holds concrete together. The difference between calcium carbonate and calcium oxide is one molecule of CO2. Forever and ever, all day long. Unless we use a completely different material for cement, that molecule of CO2 will always come off that process. There's nothing we can do about it. And in, in addition to it being very high heat where it's kind of helpful to burn something, um, we are probably going to use carbon capture and storage in cement. And the thing is, we need to build a lot of stuff to build this new energy system, so we're going to be using more cement. And so it's really important to do it better. And honestly, it's likely to be carbon capture and storage. Not because somebody is like, I want fossil fuels forever, but because it's really hard to find another way to do with that process. And you know, maybe we'll find a better cementaceous material and we'll get out of the calcium oxide business, but not soon. Um, let's go out a little further. We talk about capturing carbon. Maybe in the future we'll use that carbon. Carbon is um, the center of everything. Um, 
my water bottle, probably the clothes I'm wearing, and you too, the seats you're sitting on, are made out of hydrocarbons. Um, the carbon in those things comes from oil and gas. Um, what if we used the carbon captured from processes that are hard to decarbonize any other way and made stuff out of the carbon? Um, this is, it's possible. It's a ways out because it takes a lot of energy to go from carbon dioxide to like rayon jacket. Um, that's a really energy intensive process. But it might be somewhere that we go. You might see carbon in some processes become circular. We use it for something, it ends up getting burned in an area where we need to burn something. We capture it and we use it for something else. This is a ways out, but it's not magic. We kind of know how to do it. So it's something to look for in the future. Um, it might make sense in certain places in certain industries. So to make a long story short, and I think you've probably picked this up from everything I've said, um, there's no silver bullet strategy for this. There's no one technology that's going to save us or save the world or deal with the problem of climate change. There's just not. But that's OK. Um, there's definitely silver buckshot. Some of that silver buckshot, buckshot we know how to fire right now. When I talk about we need to decarbonize the electricity sector, we by and large know how to do that. Um, wind and solar aren't just good technologies, they're cheap technologies. Um, backing them up with other forms of power or with storage or things that we're figuring out, the best way to do that, and it's different in different places. You might see some nuclear, hydroelectricity, there are other ways to do it. You might see some batteries. Um, but we by and large know how to do this. Um, aviation is hard for the reasons I told you, but for our individual vehicles that take light vehicles, short, light, light loads, short distances that we can refuel relatively easily, batteries work fine. We know how to do this. And so to kind of wrap up my prepared marks, and then I'm open for all kinds of questions, um, the biggest challenges we face here are political. Um, the problem is not technology. I've talked about some places where we need more technology. But the two biggest emission sectors here in the United States are transportation and electricity. And I just walked you through those two sectors and told you how to deal with the lion's share of them. Um, their problem is, is that we have to do this. And doing so requires thinking differently. If you look at the political cycles that we deal with in the US, like the people I, I see in Washington all the time, they think in two-year cycles, four-year cycles, and six-year cycles. These are not two, four, or six-year issues. They're exactly the kind of issues that are difficult for politicians to take on and tackle. You need somebody with some foresight and who's willing to take risks. Um, Doing all these things also requires remaking. I said that fossil fuels built the modern world. Now we're trying to rebuild the modern world. This is not easy. Um, the energy sector is a multi-trillion dollar enterprise. And I have people, I didn't bring my cell phone up here, but I will occasionally have someone in an audience wave their cell phone at me and say, I get a new iPhone every 18 months. What is the energy sector's problem? Why can't they move faster? And the issue is that the energy sector is a lot bigger and has a lot more money in it than your $800 iPhone. And it takes a lot longer to turn over. Um, it's not so much that technology doesn't move, it's that it takes a long time to build and move the infrastructure. Um, the final thing I'll say about the politics is we need different stories. Um, I will sometimes hear people on the left, because I'm equal opportunity and I pick on everybody, People on the left talk about, we need to sacrifice. We all need to do less. You people with your fancy lifestyles are ruining the climate. OK, great. Um, that doesn't poll well. <laughs> <laughs> Telling people that they need to do less. You need to fly less, drive less, do less stuff, buy fewer things. Um, OK, maybe, they, maybe if more people did that, the climate would be better off. But we can't rely on everybody's personal virtue to do this. And if, we, and if politicians try to go out and sell that message, they're going to lose. Full stop. We, treating climate change as just an environmental issue is wrong. Climate change is multifaceted. 
um, you cannot care about the environment at all and care about climate change. And so we need to go to people and voters, because that's how decisions get made. We need to go to voters and say, OK, what do you care about? I care about national security. All right, this is why climate is for you. Somebody else, I care about paying my bills and putting food on my table. Let me tell you why you should care about climate. Um, we need to meet people where they are and bring them in, not like wag our fingers at them. Because people don't like that. And that loses elections. And so I can pick on the people who don't believe in climate all day long. But I can also pick on the people who frame this in such a way that loses elections. And so that's another part of the political problem. Um, this is a solvable problem. It's not easy. But it's fixable. And I'm going to end my remarks with a fact, just to make you all a little bit happier. Um, <laughs> so we're having this global stock take, stock take at the big climate meeting that's coming up in Dubai in like six weeks or so. Um, and there's going to be a ton of headlines about how the world is totally not on track and we're all going to hell. Um, the world is not on track for the one and a half degree goal. It just isn't. It's not quite on track for two degrees either. But it doesn't mean that nothing good has happened. If you looked um, maybe 10-ish years ago, we were on about a four degree path with you know, investments planned and policies in place, et cetera, et cetera. We're now on a two and change, maybe two and a half degree path. That ain't nothing. That is a sign of real progress. We are actually getting better. Um, doom and gloom doesn't pull well either. Um, action does. And the actions that we are taking now are working. We just need to take them faster and do more of them. And we need to figure out the technology for some of the hard stuff I described. But um, the action that we've taken to date has worked. And so somebody was in like, oh, it tells you that the world is ending and the climate is horrible. Um, the climate is changing and we need to care a lot. And we need to take action. But we know how to do a lot of things. And the action we've taken to date has made a difference. And so on that, I think I am going to stop talking for a minute. And I am going to open up for questions. And I think Caitlin can come around with a microphone. And um, you all can ask questions about stuff I brought up or stuff I didn't. Um, there are several issues that I know are big specifically here. Um, go for it. I'm happy to talk about whatever I do. But this was just my prepared talk. Question. Oh, come on. Anybody can do it. Thank you for your, <laughs> thank you for your remarks. Um, could you talk a little about how the federal actions right now are trying to speed things up? Yes. I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> so um, the biggest climate bill to ever come out of the United States Congress passed in August of 2022. This is very oddly named the Inflation Reduction Act. Not the best name for a climate bill. Um, but anyway, it, um, it is the biggest thing we've ever done. It focuses not a lot on sticks. We don't like sticks much in the United States, but it's got a lot of carrots in it. Um, we're subsidizing all kinds of things that we want to see more of. Um, looking at zero carbon power. Not just wind and solar, but any form of zero carbon power. This includes um, other technologies like geothermal. It also includes things like existing nuclear power. Hey, it's zero carbon. We're cool with it. Um, it, it subsidizes hydrogen um, to get the hydrogen economy going. Um, hydrogen is used now in like refineries and pet chem plants and to make ammonia, but it's not used in the ways that I'm describing. Um, and so getting low carbon hydrogen into those processes and then growing it out into doing some of the things that I described that it can also do. Um, there are subsidies for electric vehicles. Um, they're nicely designed in a way that they're income capped. So it's not just paying people with money to buy electric vehicles they might have bought anyway. Um, that's nice. I don't. Frankly, I'd like the subsidy, but I don't need it, whereas other people do. That's a really nice design. There's money in there for R&D. There's all kinds of things in there. There's focus on jobs. If you listen to President Biden, the things that he says, he's very focused on building the middle class and building jobs. And that shows up in this bill, too. It is very focused on bringing innovative industries into the United States. Um, 
focusing on giving larger subsidies, for instance, for electric vehicles with a certain level of components that are in the that come from the United States or from our free trade partners. Um, there are extra benefits for facilities that are built in areas that have job issues now or that are likely to suffer job losses due to the energy transition. And so trying to keep people happy and going, again, suffering doesn't, doesn't pull well. Um, so people think they're going to lose their jobs during the energy transition. We need programs to keep them happy and employed. And so it does a lot of different things. Um, it's really different than some of the policies you see in our friends, particularly Europe. They focus on pricing carbon. Um, we just can't get that done here in the US. Every European I see, oh, every trip I do, somebody asks me, when are you guys going to pass a carbon tax? And I say, no time soon. <laughs> uh, we don't like taxes here. It's a dirty word. Um, and so we like candy instead. And OK, you can complain that we're subsidizing things. But on the other hand, if we were going to get a big climate bill that did big things, it was going to look like this. And so I greatly prefer this bill to nothing. Um, it would be more economically efficient to price carbon. But honestly, this bill takes us a long way. And I'm cool with it. And I've had this discussion with a whole lot of Europeans explaining why we are the way we are. But um, it's huge. And um, I'm really glad it passed. Happy to answer more questions about it if you have specific ones, but that was the, the, the brief over here. Hi. Um, hi, Ms. Gross. Hi. Um, my question is um, wide ranging. <laughs> okay. I'm concerned that we artificially built this infrastructure for an economy, an environment that doesn't exist. For instance, we have over a hundred domestic electric vehicle companies operating. And more if you consider those coming from abroad or globally. Uh, it seems that we have a president who is advocating for um, these electric vehicles with uh, political policies. But what if we're too early? What happens with all of this infrastructure and all of this uh, financing that we've done for this uh, environment or that's yet to come and might not come, what do you see there? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I see where you're coming from. I will say that as a technology geek, electric vehicles look like the way to go for cars and trucks and the things that you and I drive. Um, for all the reasons that I said earlier, because you can, um, the weight of the battery isn't such a big deal if you're not carrying heavy loads and you can refuel it often, um, which we by and large can do. And so I don't see another technology coming along for light vehicles that's better. Where your question really comes into play is on um, some other forms of transportation. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on is trucking. Like, not like short distance runs, you can electrify those too, but like long distance trucking, we're still figuring out what technology is going to work for there because batteries are heavy. And to have a battery that can go a long distance, you're taking up a big chunk of the weight of the truck. Plus, if you're going to, you know, time is money in long distance trucking. Those guys want to be driving. Um, and so when you stop to recharge, you want to do it quickly. But the amount of power it takes to fast charge a semi-truck's worth of battery is outrageous. You're talking like megawatt levels of power. That is a lot of juice. And that is because diesel fuel is really energy dense. So you think about the flow of the diesel fuel into the tank versus the flow of electricity into the engine. It is a ton of energy. And so that just from a point of view of like keeping the grid going is hard. Um, but you do see places jumping ahead and saying, we're going to electrify trucking. California is doing it. I'm not convinced it's a good idea, because I don't think that electricity may be where we land. And that's an issue where the question is, are we too soon? And are we moving too fast? And are we picking technologies that might not be winners? Um, so there's spaces where I worry about that. But light electric vehicles aren't one of them. Um, I don't see another technology that, that looks any better. Um, so that question is live, but it, it's live in a slightly different space, um, for me anyway. Um, 
Hi. Um, Hi. In the lecture, you kind of spoke about the role that multi-trillion like, energy companies have. Um, do you see smaller companies and startups also playing a role in transitioning to green energy? Yeah. I mean, big companies have big money and are accustomed to doing big things, and that's good. And you see a lot of these companies changing the way they do business or making investments that are greener, and that's cool. But um, startup culture is real. Like some guys in a lab or a garage or whatever figuring out a new technology and trying to figure out how to make money off of it, like that's an American tradition. And people look at this problem and they see dollar signs. And I mean that in a good way. I mean the way you fix, pro when people can make money fixing a problem, you can't stop people fixing the problem. <laughs> and so yeah, I think there is a really strong culture of innovation, especially in certain sectors. Um, you see that somewhat in the vehicle sector. You're saying that there's like 100 electric vehicle companies in the United States. Awesome. They're not all going to make it. You look back to the old days where of like some car companies went out of business, some consolidated. Um, and you know, we have sort of the big three here now, but it didn't used to be that way. Electric vehicles are going to go the same way. Some companies are going to make it because they have a superior product. Some are going to die. Some are going to combine. That's OK. That, that's the market for you. And so I'm actually excited about innovation in various spaces. And I also think that's what the US is good at. And that's something that makes me, our politics are challenging. But other parts of the US are really conducive to doing these things. And one, two of those things are our innovation culture and our culture of like venture capital and finance and the fact that we have a country that puts money into, into risky things to see if they pan out. And so that's, you know, the politics are rough, but that makes me optimistic. Uh, how might driverless uh, vehicles affect energy use? And also, is there anything that might have been done or might yet be done to downsize vehicles? And I, I suspect that'll make a great deal of difference uh, along many dimensions, not just uh, energy use, but uh, congestion and uh, all sorts of other problems. Yeah, you ask some good questions. Um, driverless vehicles, autonomous vehicles, were all the rage um, maybe four-ish, maybe a little longer ago. People are like, they are going to change everything. Um, I have mixed feelings, and I hear smart people who think about this all day long come up with different opinions. I know um, very smart people who think that autonomous vehicles will be the answer to reducing energy use. Because he sort of foresees you know, free-ranging the Uber of autonomous vehicles, driving people around, and people not owning private cars, because it's too darn convenient to take one of these things. Um, that you share them, that they, they work very efficiently, and that they bring our emissions down. I also know people, very smart, very thoughtful people, who think that autonomous vehicles will increase our energy use, because they will be so darn convenient that we can go somewhere and take a nap or work while we're doing it, and that we will become more willing to commute longer distances, for instance. Like, if I can get into my autonomous vehicle, crawl into the back seat, and go to sleep, um, I might be willing to commute a lot farther, or I might be willing to drive places I wouldn't have driven otherwise. Um, I don't know which of those people is right. Um, I'm not sure anybody knows. I mean, these are, these are smart, well-respected people saying these things. Um, we'll see. But the other thing that's interesting about autonomous vehicles, they tend to be electric. So that's, that's a good thing. You know, we need to decarbonize the grid at the same time, but this is a good thing. Um, the other thing is the technology. We were so sure we had the technology wired. And so not very long ago, I was like, these are coming. These are going to be here in no time flat. And they're getting a lot of bad press now. Um, I recently saw that San Francisco. Um, I don't know what the right word is, but sort of revoked Cruz's license to test their cars on San Francisco streets after they had some accidents, including to, I love this, a car that like drove into wet cement. <laughs> a person probably wouldn't have done that. But again, the autonomous vehicle is only as smart as you have trained it, and it's hard to train it for every single eventuality. And apparently a wet cement sign was not in its training. 
<laughs> so um, the date when these things are going to take over the world keeps getting moved back, and I don't know when it's going to happen. And I don't know if these are like little blips that we're going to fix and we're going to get right back on the road, or whether these are going to be like really big challenges. But um, the autonomous vehicle space is getting kind of interesting now. Even in just the last few weeks, this thing happened with crews. So we'll see. Hi. I hear a lot of clean energy critics ask about what happens to electric vehicle batteries after they break or die. Yeah. Um, they suggest that all of these leftover batteries will have a, a negative environmental impact. And so I was just wondering what I should say to those people. Yeah, I, um, I have a few things to say to that. Um, one of them is unfortunate but true, which is there is no perfectly clean technology. Um, I wish there was. We'd all be ad advocating for it, building like crazy. Um, it's all trade-offs. The production of some of those battery minerals and the things that, you know, substances that go into the, the magnets and wind turbines, too. Like, it's not just batteries. Um, they have environmental impacts when we produce them. The flip side of that is you think about quantity. Like, the amount of stuff, the lithium and the cobalt and everything else that, that's difficult, that goes into a car battery that you build once and you drive it for however many years or thousands of miles, versus the amount of oil, of oil production that went into the fuel that will drive that thing for all that distance. Um, it's exponentially different. So we are still producing some things that have environmental impacts, definitely. We need to work on doing them better. Um, but the difference in impact between that and a whole lot of oil production is, is worth talking about. The other thing is at the end of their lives, there's not a real system to recycle them yet, largely because there's not enough of them that have died and entered the system. When we have more raw material, there are companies, and this is a really popular, you talked about innovation. Um, this is a really popular area of innovation and, and startup businesses right now is recycling those batteries and pulling those nasty minerals out so we don't have to mine them again, we can reuse them. One last thing is there's also talk about when the battery is not really good enough to power a vehicle anymore, but it's not dead, you know, you really need your electric vehicle battery to be top notch. You don't want to get stranded by the side of the road. But um, as like backups for home systems or grid systems, um, you don't need, the battery doesn't need to be quite as, quite as fresh. So you also hear about sort of a cycle of batteries of like going into vehicles, then finding a second life as like backup power somewhere and then getting recycled. So we're, so we're both the, the reuse and the recycle part of the, and so that's another thing that I think you'll see happen. But I think you'll see people starting to treat those as raw materials and that's a good thing. Hi, thank you for so much for the lecture. I have three, not three questions, I just want your opinion on three technologies. Uh, first, superconductors, like the one that you see on Twitter, like LK99. Uh, second, uh, synthetic uh, fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, third is mag rails or like trains between cities and stuff. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go on the one I know the most about first. Um, there are a couple of those that I'm actually just not as knowledgeable about, but I wanna talk about synthetic fossil fuels because that is interesting. Um, remember when I talked in the, in, the, in the lecture about reusing carbon? You can make fossil fuels out of reused carbon. You can totally put those molecules back together and get something that is chemically identical to the diesel fluoro gasoline you would have gotten out of oil that came out of the ground. We know how to do this. The problem with it is it's really energy intensive. If you think about it from like a thermochemical perspective, you're running combustion backwards. And so the amount of energy you would have got out of combustion, you're putting in plus some to put the molecule back together. We can do this. If we have a whole lot of cheap electricity, you can do this. Um, it makes absolutely no sense to run my Mini Cooper on that stuff. None whatsoever. Um, because the energy penalty is too high and it's way, way more efficient to run my Mini Cooper on a battery. Aviation, hmm, that's where it starts to get interesting because you really need something that looks like, that looks like jet fuel. We could, maybe we're gonna make synthetic jet fuel. We're gonna need a whole lot of low carbon electricity to do it, but we might do it in those areas where we really need something that looks like jet fuel and there's not a good other way to do it. And so it kind of, it's kind of back to my hydrogen argument. You only do it when you really, really need it because it's an energy intensive process, but it can work. 
um, we're gonna need a whole lot of power for that. Maybe we need next generation nuclear or a whole lot of renewables or something. But um, if we have that, that might make sense for those areas where nothing else works. Um, the magnets and the other stuff, I just don't know as much. I'm sort of not a physicist, I'm just an energy geek. And so I just don't even have good information. I had a fascinating conversation with two different people in the last week about fusion. One said they're gonna have an operating commercial reactor in 10 years, and the other guy told me that that guy was crazy. <laughs> so, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a nuclear physicist. I have no idea which one of them is correct. And honestly, I don't think it's clear which one of them is correct yet. <laughs> but that's where a lot of those like fancy new materials are going. Can you talk about the tension and maybe the pros and cons of utility level solar versus home solar yes. and NV Energy wanting to be themselves versus I want to put solar in my roof. Yes, that is a very interesting topic. Um, you can come at it from a number of different angles. Um, one angle is just pure cost per unit of electricity delivered. Um, big utility scale projects are cheaper because you're spreading the costs of like all the ancillary stuff over a bigger project. And you know, you're building a big project all at once rather than little one-off projects in people's roofs. Um, so utility scale will forever and always be cheaper. It may not forever and always be better. There is some advantage to having solar panels on, on your roof. In my house in Mexico, I have to have solar panels on my roof and a battery. Um, when we have hurricanes, which we do, my power doesn't go out. I sometimes don't notice when the power goes out. I am sitting under the ceiling fan watching my TV and nothing happens. It's fantastic. My neighbors hate me. <laughs> I'm not joking. I've had people be like, I'm like, not my problem. <laughs> so like you get ancillary benefits from having that solar power on your house, like as the homeowner. And those benefits may be worth paying for. Um, the other thing that is really interesting, like you're talking about Nevada power policies, and I don't know how they pay the consumers for the power, but that is a really interesting, both a political issue and like an economic issue for the utilities. So a lot of states do net metering. So what they do is if, when you send power back to the grid from your solar panels, if you're making more than you're using, um, you know, they subtract that off your bill. So in essence, what the utility is doing is paying you the retail rate for that electricity. And people like net metering, and I get it. And I get that it makes logical sense. But it's also the most expensive electricity that utility buys. Like, they don't buy or make electricity at a cost of the retail rate. <laughs> they just don't. And in addition, when they're doing this, when we have all these people self-generating, they're spreading the cost of the grid and even me, like my little house, I'm still on the grid with CFE, my local utility, um, because I run on grid power. You know, my solar system won't run my air conditioners, for instance. Like, I still want grid power. Um, so they're spreading the cost of that grid power over less electricity sold to fewer homes. And so it can actually be a little bit of a death spiral for the utility if they net meter and too many people put panels on the roof. And so when I hear, oh my god, it's terrible for solar that we're not met net metering anymore, I'm like, Arr. you don't necessarily want to kill the utility because you still need it. And so these are balancing questions and political questions, but um, the answer isn't obviously the utility must net meter or you shouldn't put solar on your roof. Um, there, are, there are pros and cons to each, and there are some benefits to you as a consumer for doing it. And I know because I've done it. <laughs> So I'm interested in two things on the idea about the Inflation Reduction Act sort of incentivizing American made or American partner yeah. products being purchased. I'm wondering how that's going to factor in with the new climate core and how that's sort of going to create a new American workforce or at least incentivize that. That's an interesting question. I haven't heard that question before. It's a good one. My guess is that the climate core will do different stuff. Um, when you look at the jobs that are going to be created by the IRA, I think those are going to be in things like manufacturing, um, installation. One of the issues that's not tackled in the IRA that I hope we tackle soon is labor force. This has the potential to create a lot of 
good paying jobs that don't require a four year college degree. We need technicians. We need people who know how to put in solar panels. We need HVAC people who know how to install these heat pumps I like so much. Um, my guess is that those jobs in the Civilian Climate Corps will be doing different things. I'm gonna guess that the Civilian Climate Corps will largely do things that businesses don't do. Um, things like working on adaptation projects or uh, your projects that make cities and communities more resilient. That's what I hope the Climate Corps does because businesses will do the other stuff. They can make money doing that. And so I hope we put the Climate Corps to work doing stuff that businesses don't do. But we have this new, young, energetic workforce that wants to do those things. Because, you know, if businesses will do it, then government probably shouldn't. So I want, the, I want that Climate Corps doing something else. Okay, more security-based question, because sure. I was also interested in this one. Uh, the U.S. withdrew from accepting lithium and cobalt from Congo, uh, or at least products that were made with it. And I'm interested if you think that that's sort of going to be a global move to at least push better working conditions or better work-related um, safety precautions in countries that we source a lot of our... Yeah. raw materials for low carbon future. I hope so. I really do. And um, the point of that is not to stop buying lithium. The point of that is to make them do better. Yeah. And so, I mean, the US can't do it alone, but you hope that enough countries band together and say, you must do better. Um, but two things make that possible. One of them is companies saying, we won't buy your stuff until you get better. Um, the other is alternate suppliers. If they have us over a barrel, if we can only get cobalt from the Congo, we're kind of stuck. Um, in order for that, um, that pressure to be real and effective, we need an alternate supplier of cobalt, or at least the promise of an alternate co supplier of cobalt. Like we, need to, we need a credible threat. And so, I mean, you see the Inflation Reduction Act pushing for buying materials from either the United States or from our friends. And um, part of that is protectionist against China, but part of it is a lot more positive. And it's a way of knowing that those materials were produced better. Like, we generally don't have child or slave labor in this country or in our, our friends and our trading partners. So, um, but we need those new facilities to make that credible threat to make people do better. And so it's not just protectionist. It also provides this thing that, that you're asking for that's really important. Like those people just, you know, those people are providing these products that's intended to make the world better. Like they deserve better working conditions. It's ridiculous. But we have to have a credible pressure to be able to make them do it. Sorry. Um, so my question has to do with more local level um, policy. What would you say are like local initiatives that we should like, I guess broadly my question is like, what's next? How do we get started? Um, and so, you know, as a college student, what should I be doing? What should I be telling my state legislators to be doing? You know, yeah. like a lot of college students are trying to get their um, universities to divest from fossil fuels? Is that the way to go? What policies should I be personally fighting for in my own community? Yeah, I love that question. Thank you. Um, here's the deal. I understand the desire to divest from fossil fuels. I don't think it's the most effective place to put your time. And here's why. Um, I wrote a paper on this also. It's on the Brookings website if you want to Google it. It came out, I don't know, a couple months ago. But um, there's a lot of oil and gas in the world. If you divest from ExxonMobil and they stop producing oil and gas, someone else will because there's lots of it. It's not scarce. It's actually plentiful. Um, it is true that the amount of oil and gas in the world is finite, but it is also true that we are nowhere near the end of it. Um, and so you can cut off these companies, and I understand why. And I definitely, I, I almost better understand staying invested so that you have a seat at the table. Not necessarily you personally, but the, the wider people who care about this stuff. Rather than divesting, joining together and putting hold, hold shareholder re resolutions to put their feet to the fire. I like that better, because I think it's more effective. Um, one of the things, I mean, the best thing that everybody in this room can do, and you absolutely have to do, or I won't let you leave, is vote. <laughs> vote, 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 vote. 
vote. Vote for everything from your local school board to the presidential election, everything in between. Because all of this stuff matters. I mean, you're like, I don't have kids. Why do I care who's on the school board? Because we are educating the next generation, so they're at least working off the same set of technical facts. You care who's on the school board. I care who's on the school board. Um, these things are important. Um, so that's, that's an obvious thing to do. But the other thing to do, like when you're dealing with like UNLV, per, for instance, and I know that you're really involved in the plan to green up UNLV and thinking about plans to make the, this campus um, more sustainable and more energy efficient, that's fantastic. When you think about local communities and what local communities can do, um, you know, some things they can't do. They don't set international policy. They're not figuring out how much oil and gas we use. But they can think about how they develop. What kind of housing do you approve? Do you approve dense housing that's near transit so that people who live in those homes will drive less? You know, you can't shove that down people's throats. But if you make it attractive, people will come. I live in a community like that, and I love it. I own a car, but I barely drive it. Um, and I like it. I have fancy restaurants and a metro station across the street, and I'm into it. So if you do that kind of urban planning, people like it. And so trying to find ways to contribute to like your little campus community, your larger community through, through voting and through you know, community initiatives and, and things that are trying to make your community more efficient. Because like planning and transportation are something that's generally done at the community level. And so those are the kinds of things where ordinary people can get pretty deeply involved in that. Like, you don't need money and to run for Congress. And those things make a difference in how efficient your community is. And they also make it a better place to live, um, which isn't nothing. So um, thinking of like where you are right now, those are the things I would do. But for God's sake, vote. <laughs> <laughs> You'll join me all in thanking Samantha. Oh. Thank you. And thanks to you. Thanks to you so much. Thanks to all of you for the great questions, and I appreciate your coming out. Truly, thank you for the, the vibrant discussion. This was yeah, so exactly. interesting. Um, if you have lingering questions, Samantha will be here for a yeah. few additional minutes afterwards if you'd like to chat with her. Before you run off tonight, um, I want to advertise our next talk, which is actually next Tuesday, not Wednesday. We typically do these Wednesdays. So Tuesday, the 7th of November, here, same time, 6 p.m. We're going to be joined by uh, Molly Kinder, a colleague who has not yet visited uh, Brookings Mountain West, but we're very excited to be welcoming her for her first trip. Yes. And uh, she's coming from Brookings Metro. She will have a really interesting talk next week on uh, the topic of headwinds and tailwinds, the present and future of work for women. Um, I hope you will come out and join us for that as well. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone.